Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Vanoon here with Israeli News Live on our Patreon channel. Thank you for joining us today. And I am sure it's going to be a blessing. We're going to be talking about the Nephilim. And the, a subject really won't go into how I, I got back on this once again. I have taught on this before. But uh, a good friend of mine, we were dis having this discussion about the uh, fallen ones, the fallen angels, as well as the giants that they produced. And how did it get from pre-Andalubian destruction, the flood, to post-Andalubian destruction, and we have giants all over again. It's almost like, what happened? I thought God just wiped them out and we were done with them and no more problems, right? Well, the answer to that is not as simple as you might think. Well, well I don't know, maybe we should say it is as simple as you should think it is. But a lot of people never pay attention to how the scripture is actually written on these issues. And there is clear biblical evidence to support both New and Old Testament that, yes, they did return. Just because of the destruction didn't mean that they wiped them out forever. And it doesn't mean that all the fallen angels were fallen in the first place. Or not all the angels that were around actually fell. Maybe that would be the more appropriate way to put it. In fact, if we look at the book of Enoch, it's only about 200 of the angels actually fell. And we know there's a heck of a lot more than 200 uh, that came down when Satan come down, right? Uh, so something doesn't seem to be quite right. And clearly we know that Joshua was faced with giants. In fact, when I was looking online, I was looking at a lot of the biblical arguments. They were all saying, no, there's no such thing. They're uh, there never was any more giants after that. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, gosh, did everybody forget what happened in the, uh, in the Old Testament? And one guy actually brings out in his argument that, well, the spies came back with a false report. Uh, and that was his basis of his argument, saying that there really wasn't giants after all. Well, I guess David didn't kill a giant, did he? Ay, ay, ay. What a mess this turns out to be. Well, like I said, I've taught on this before. Uh, but here on Patreon, I'm going to share with you guys very clearly how it happened. And no, it's not a false. That's not the false report. Wasn't the giants? Because if you remember Caleb and Joshua, that still the people, they said we're more than able to conquer them. Ah, so they didn't deny the fact there were giants. Think about that, right? So we're going to look at some things that Peter said, some things that Jude says as well. We're going to clear up this information you're going to realize that yes both before the andalusian destruction and after the andalusian destruction we did have giants now i don't know if i said this at the beginning of the broadcast the picture i'm using on the screen i don't know if it's authentic or not i wasn't using it for that purpose more as a prop to give us an idea of giants that were on the earth in some type of form years ago whether it be poster uh, poster pre uh, Andalusian is neither here nor there. It's just really more for a prop here for a visual. Let's get right into the scripture here. Second Peter, a lot of times is often used to try to say that the end of all the giants were done during the flood. But oddly enough, Peter doesn't really say that. In fact, he gives you enough information to make you want to do more research. And that's what I'm going to do with you now. Let's go right into it. For if God spared not the angels, we're reading the second, uh, second chapter of 2 Peter, verse 4, uh, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow and making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. And delivered just lot vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. And the Lord know, knoweth how to deliver the, go the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Now, what I find fascinating is when scholars try to take and use 2 Peter as the end of the giants or the Nephilim being pre-flood, I'm like, why do they just 
come along with that idea when Peter is actually comparing Sodom and Gomorrah to the exact same sin of what happened before the flood. That would indicate then Sodom and Gomorrah had nothing to do with homosexuality. So think about that for a moment. And I'm not here to support a lifestyle or a choice that these people make in this world. My point is, though, is that Peter is not actually talking about what most people think. And you're going to find that out in just a little bit when we get over to the book of uh, Jude. Now, before we do, though, let's take a little step back into the Old Testament because one of the things that a lot of people think is that... Um, let me get rid of that one there. We've re-highlighted again because it didn't do it right. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people do not ever pay attention to because of the King James Version, we don't have the word Nephilim written in there in the first place. But in the Hebrew text, we do. And that's what we want to look at. And I've gone into this with you guys before. So some of you that may be the first time, some of you it may not be the first time. But let's take a look at what it says. We'll start with verse 30, 32. And we are in the book of Numbers, uh, specifically, oh gosh, I forget, I think it's chapter 13, if I'm not mistaken. I'll just double check that for you. Yes, Numbers chapter 13, verse 32. And they spread an evil report of the land which they had spied out unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have passed to spy it out is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it, are men of great stature. Now, if you notice, they said they eat the people up. Now, that's exactly what they were doing before the flood. They couldn't sustain them with the life of the, uh, of the, of the from farming and things like that. And so the giants, the, the children of the, the fallen angels, began to eat the human beings. They began to eat the animals. They began to eat everything, reptiles included, consuming everything that was in sight. And here the spies are saying the exact same thing. And, and, there, and, and they go on to say, And there we saw the Nephilim, that's correct, the sons of Enoch. Now, I have highlighted for you in the Hebrew language. i got to keep moving that because it's kind of, well, it doesn't matter if it covers that up or not. Et ha Nephilim, and it's he nun fe yod, notice in the green, yod, lamet yod mim. Now, Moses intentionally spells it Nephilim and giving it the Dagish there with the Fe, so you pronounce it Nephilim. Bene Anach, the sons of Anak. And then he says, Min Ha. Now, this is where I disagree with the rabbis when they don't put the, they don't put the punctuation properly, because now Moses removes the Yod. And he says, min ha, it should be pronounced nephalim. Nephalim. So if Moses intentionally spells it differently, there's a reason for that. And he's trying to get you to understand that Enoch, he is from a fallen one, or a fallen angel in this case here. So, that's one of the first evidences that we have that after the flood, we're dealing with a man, Enoch, and his father, I forget his name, uh, Arad or Arad, something like that. I'll, we'll look it up here in just a moment here. That his father is a fallen angel. In fact, the city Hebron was renamed after the very city of Anak's father, not, not that his father's name was, let me, let me see, I think we got it right here in Joshua. Um, let's see, and all the kingdoms of Og and Bashan who reigned in Ashtaroth and Edredi, the same was left of the remnant of the Rif, no, I'm sorry, that's the Rifaim. I'll get into it in just a minute here. Uh, but anyway, let's see. I, I'll tell you what, let me, let me real quick, let's find Anak's father's name. I wanted you to, rem, I wanted to be able to make sure you know. Um, Arabah, I think is his name though, but let me just double check it real quick. The children of Anak, 
Let's see. Okay, here we Araba. I was right. Araba was his father's name right there. Said, and uh, this is in Joshua 15, 13. And to Caleb, the son of uh, Jephunneh, he gave a part among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, even the city of Arabah, the father of Anak, which is which city is Hebron. So Hebron was uh, originally named Arabah, and that was Anak's father. So Arabah is a fallen angel. And of course, this whole region was filled with giants at that time, what we call modern day Israel. So going back over here, let me get back into numbers. So now Moses, like I said, Moses clearly identifies that, and I'm gonna unhile, there we go, that, uh, that the children or the sons of Anak are Nephilim, Hanephilim. But when it comes to Enoch, he is from Nephilim. Plain as day, right there. There it is, Nephilim. No yod in there. Over in the green, again, I'm trying to make emphasis on this. You see the yod in there. If we go to Genesis 6, chapter 6, we're going to find another interesting point here that makes it as well. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives whomsoever they chose. B'nei ha'elohim et ha'banot ha'adam. Ki tovah tine. All right, so we, we see that. Ve'yoreh, I forgot. Ve'yoreh, excuse me. Ve'yoreh, b'nei ha'elohim. And saw, literally, the sons of, of the gods. Et banot ha'adam, the daughters of of Adam or the daughters of man showing that they are earthly women. So the sons of God are not this they're not earthly men. It would have said bene Adam, not bene ha Elohim. And they and they were fair and they took them wives whomsoever they chose. And the Lord said, "My spirit shall not abide a man forever, for that he is also flesh. Therefore shall his days be 120 years." And then we have right here the Nephilim were in the earth in those days. And also after that, were when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, the same were the mighty men were of old, the men of renown. But here it is again. Moses spells it Nephilim, Hayubahats. The fallen ones were in the earth in those days, and also after that, okay, Beyamim Hahem, Vegam Achreken, which means, and also after this, Asha Yabo Bene Haaluhim El Banot Adam. So they're identifying that the sons of God are the fallen angels. This is not the children of them. The children are born afterwards, and they bore children to them. And the same become the men of renown. Anosh Hashem, or the children of the name. That's what that, that gets. And of course, being the name would be they become Nephilim. Then Moses would add the extra yod in there, making the Dagish, as we see in the book of Numbers, where he identifies them. That's where they get their name. Now, another name they're given as well is like what we find in the book of Joshua. The kingdom of Og and Bashan, uh, who reigned in Ashtaroth and Edurai, the same, and we are in, by the way, we're in the book of, um, we're in the book of Joshua chapter 13, just so you know where we're at. Who reigned in Ashtaroth and Edari, the same was left of the remnant of the Raphaim, for those for these did Moses smite and drove them out. Now they're called Raphaim. Why Raphaim? Literally, the dead ones. And why are they called dead ones? Because once you mingle that seed with mankind and fallen angel kind, they're done. Nevertheless, the children of Israel drove not out the uh, Geshurites nor the Mechathites, but Geshur and Mechath dwelt in the midst of Israel unto this day. 
and yet they're still among them. If you remember in Ezra that they had mingled their seed with these fallen angels. And let me, we're going to need that. So let me just real quick, I'll bring that up because uh, I know it's going to be needed here. And, and gosh, many of you have been here with me so long, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, Steve, we know this one by heart. You've done this so much. We know it by heart. Chapter 9. Now, when these things were done, the princes drew near unto me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests of the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands, doing according to their abominations. That right there is very important. Doing according to their abominations. Even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons. Right? For their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the peoples of the lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and rulers have been first in this faithlessness. When I heard this, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair off my head of my beard and sat down appalled. Why? Why do you think Ezra would be appalled over this? It's the worst sin you could ever commit. And in this case here, it's not the fallen angels that they're intermingling the seed with, but it is the children of the fallen angels because the people of the lands, the abominations were the Perzites, Hittites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites. They had all mingled their seed with the fallen angels. And that's what was going on. Now the question though, like I said, the question is, if God destroyed, though, all the fallen angels' children in the flood, how do they get over on this side? Now, clearly, we're seeing that scripturally, in the book of Numbers, they're there. Joshua shows us that they're there. They come out, they spout the land. M Moses said, and Caleb stilled the people toward Moses and said, we should go up at once and possess it. Let me just back up a little bit more. So we got to know about the, all these other people here. Um, we came into the land... Uh, whether thou sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is a and fruit as this is the fruit of it. Howbeit the people that dwell in the land are fierce, and the cities are fortified and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Now remember, Anak, we already know at the very end there are fallen angels, or his children are the descendants. Of, you know, he's a descendant of a fallen angel directly. Amalek dwelleth in the land of the south, the Hittite, the Jebusite, and the Amorite dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanite dwell in the sea, and along by the side of the Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people toward Moses and said, We should go up at once and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. Now see, Caleb doesn't deny that they're there. He just says we're able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. Okay? They're stronger than we are. Now, <laughs> and they spread an evil report of the land, which they had spied out unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have passed to spy it out is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. They eat everybody. They gobble them down. And of course, then they go to tell you, we saw the Nephilim. In other words, we saw the giants. We saw them there. We know now that they're giants there. So we have that evidence, and we know that it's not just the Amalekites, but as we clearly see, we have these other races as well, the Hittite, the Jebusites, the Amorites, all of them known to have mingled seed amongst fallen angels. Uh, now, but like I said, this is after the flood. How did they get here? It seems that Jude gives us a little bit of that answer. If you look at what he said, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ and called 
mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So the common salvation is not what you should be looking at. You need to look for that contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. There's your first clue right there. Now we're in the time of Jesus. Jesus has already died, rose again from the dead, and now he's talking about men creeping in unaware who were before of old ordained to this condemn condemnation. What men of old are, are, have crept in that were condemned? Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord and God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the, like I said, the first clue is they were ordained to condemnation. The only people ever ordained to condemnation were the Nephilim, the sons of the fallen angels, that there was no mercy. They were brought to judgment. The fallen angels themselves, and that was only about 200 according to the book of Enoch, were chained and put in prison in a place that I believe was part of what we would call inner earth. Once they were in prison there, now what, we, what do we have? I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. Now here's where it gets interesting. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved into everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Now he's getting more plain about it. He's talking about the fallen angels. But then he compares the fallen angels pre-flood to a post-flood event of Sodom and Gomorrah. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication. What? Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication? That's what the fallen angels did. They were fornicating. They were fornicating with human women when they had no business doing so. And so now he's saying that in Sodom and Gomorrah, the same thing was happening again. This is nothing about homosexuality. This is about having a fornication with a species that is not of your species. And oddly enough, in some of the ancient documents, that's exactly what fornication is referred to. Fallen angels sleeping with earthly women is considered a fornication. And going after strange flesh, that literally that word in the Greek, the strange flesh, again, has nothing to do with procreation, man with man or woman with woman, although we do have that condemnation scripturally, it's not what it's talking about. It's talking about a type of being that is not earthly, although in an earthly form. And set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, again, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, Sodom and Gomorrah was burnt, but it's not eternal fire, is it? But if you remember that, they were foreordained to this condemnation. He's talking about the same thing like in the case of the flood, where the flood killed everybody off originally, the children of the fallen angels. Now he's talking about the final judgment, which is a consuming fire that just doesn't seem to ever want to stop. Like also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring it against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Now, we can go on and on and on. Uh, well, let's go a little further down. These are spots in your feasts of charity, and they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about uh, of winds, trees whose fruit there uh, wherewith 
and without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Now, the only difference is now than the time, say, of when Joshua was on the earth, it seems that they're not as big as they once were. That's one of the mysteries that you find here. Raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame, but watch what he calls them. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness and darkness forever. Yeah. That's what the fallen angels are referred to as, as well. Wandering stars. Fallen stars. Enoch also the seventh from Adam, Adam prophesied of these. Prophesied of the fallen angels. Saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all. And to convince all that are ungodly among them and all that their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So this is why the Lord comes with his own army to bring an end to what they have done. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust. Their mouth speaks great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember you the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves sensually, having not the Spirit. And there again, sensual. And, and of course, we're still dealing with that fornication as he lays out in the beginning. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ into eternal life. So the issue is, is Jude himself is identifying that they're here. Even long after the, the case of Joshua, he identifies them as the same, even the ones in Sodom and Gomorrah, as being the same one, as the angels that did not keep their first estate. So in that case there, we are clearly finding, see, watch this, and I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not, and the angels which catch not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved and left everlasting chains unto darkness, unto judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner giving themselves over to fornication. So in Sodom and Gomorrah, they had also gave over to the fornication just like what the fallen angels did. So Jude has identified that. And then he goes into how they creep in unaware. Totally slipped in now because now they're no longer giants, but they're still around. I guess the argument comes up is to undoubtedly more angels fell after the flood and came to earth and continued to try to procreate with women. That seems to be what is really going on. And that's what we get with verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. They crept in. They got in somehow. And yet, he identifies them the same as the fallen angels. They were ordained to condemnation. I hope that settles some of this debate. I know it's not an easy one. Um, oh, by the way, I ran across this one scripture. I figured I'd just throw this out here for you. This is, a little, this is just a little funny one here, right? Uh, I was looking at Habakkuk, and I was actually reading this in the Dead Sea Scrolls and looking at some of their interpretations there. Said so their horses also were swifter than leopards and are more fierce than the wolves of the desert. Their horsemen, not the horses now, the horsemen spread themselves. Yea, their horsemen come from far, they fly as a vulture that hastens to devour. Uh, that is very interesting, if you ask me. Almost as if. They have a modern type technology. Is this what the prophet was seeing prophetically of a judgment that would come uh, in the future? 
but the horsemen are able to fly. Some translate that as an eagle, some translate it as a vulture, and they're coming to devour. I thought I'd just throw that in there while we're at it here. Anyway, I got more to share with you on Patreon. This is just the first one there. I still have that one video I told you I was going to put up. I will try to get that in here this weekend for sure. I think you'll really like that as well. God bless you and thank you for listening.